In October of 1979, a couple of months after Glinda Sodeman's disappearance, the troopers learn a young boy who is out rabbit hunting with his father found a body buried in the snow in the Moose Creek area, about eight miles south of North Pole. I was in the office uh, in Fairbanks, and I was notified that there had been a, a body found. And I immediately responded down there. She had been strangled. There was a gunshot wound to her head. No defensive wounds that we could find. No disruption of her clothing. Once I talked to Linda Soderman's father, Ellis, and I described the body to him and the clothing, he said, that's her. Later on, we performed an autopsy, and she was identified uh, right away. I remember I answered the phone, I gave it to my mom, and she went hysterical. We just, just hugged each other, comforted each other. Didn't want to accept him. I was just hurt. It's sad. Winter and spring pass with no breaks in the case. As summer arrives, another tragedy strikes. On June of 80, we got the call of a missing 11-year-old. Doris Oring, a top student at her school, well-liked, was riding her bicycle from swimming lessons in North Pole to her home eight miles away off of Badger Road and disappeared. Somebody called us and found the bike. And then that was the closest thing we had for a crime scene. It was every parent's nightmare. We don't know that it's connected to Glinda Thoderman. We're not. We have no idea, but could be related. So it's an emergency situation. Where is this little girl? We have to find her fast. Hundreds of volunteers looked for her from Fairbanks to beyond Moose Creek. We went out on force. Something about an 11-year-old or, or any kind of small child, you know, it, it's different. Once the word got out of the community, we got calls. And uh, the most important call was from a guy we're driving by in the Badger Road area, and he sees a bluish car pulling out of that trail at a pretty high rate of speed, and he was struggling with something on the seat in the front. That was significant. Talking to Doris Oring's brother, we found that a day or two before, he had been riding home on that same route Doris was ahead on her bicycle, and her brother came up uh, behind her and saw his sister talking to a man. He got into his blue car. It started up, and he drove away. And a couple of days later, uh, Doris was on her bicycle again, on her way home, using the same road and she disappeared. Doris Oring's brother mentioned the man had a GI kind of haircut and wearing a military-type uniform. The more we looked at Thomas Richard Bundy, the better he looked. We've got circumstantial evidence. 
we've got photographic lineup, but we do not have enough to arrest him. We needed stronger evidence. I put out a bulletin to all the law enforcement agencies all over the United States if you had any unsolved female homicides that the MO matched like ours, fully dressed, laying along the road, strangled, shot in the head, which is kind of an unusual MO. And sure enough, Henrietta, Texas, responded that they had one. I went down there, went to the sheriff's office, and I asked about the case, and he said, oh, it's, that's solved, the case is solved. We don't have any unsolved homicides in Henrietta County. And uh, this was a sheriff with cowboy boots and a hat and a gun with his foot on the desk. And I said, well, how was it solved? Well, we understood that she knew somebody who knew a drug dealer in Dallas, and the drug dealer got blown up in a meth lab. So we just figured it was him, and we closed our case. I said, do you have any evidence? And he said, Ethel, and then she was the clerk out front, come in here and get this trooper some evidence on that homicide of ours. And she opens a file drawer behind his desk, and she pulls out a Polaroid photograph. And I'm looking at it. <laughs> I said, what is this? Them's tire tracks. The tire tracks found near the scene of the crime. I said, there's no reference point, no measurements or anything in there? Oh, no, we didn't, need, we didn't need that. We just took the picture. I said, OK. Thank you, Sheriff. And away I went. I don't know whether Bundy killed that girl or not, and uh, nobody will ever know. After the search is conducted at Bundy's house in Texas, we drive back to the hotel, and I said, I'm taking a shower. I mean, we're from the frozen north, and we've been in this sweltering heat down here all day. So I'm in the shower, and the phone rings. Who the heck is that? Pick up the telephone, and I hear, hey, Jim, this is Rich. Drop the towel. Grab my little tape recorder, and I put it up to the phone. And I said, hey, Rich, what's up? And he goes, hey, you got my uh, the keys to my car down there? I looked up on the TV where I'd put up all the keys. I said, oh, man, Rich, I got your keys. I'll run up there and get you your keys right away. I'm very sorry. He goes, no, no, no. He said, I'm coming by to see you again tomorrow, right? And I said, oh, yeah, that's right. While Bundy's on the phone, I'm looking at that poster that was put out. The brass added that sixth case on there that had nothing to do with Richard Bundy. It was a murder case of a native woman down towards Anchorage. He's ready to hang up. I just, I seized the moment. <clears throat> I said, Rich, it wasn't all six of them, was it? Nothing. Didn't say anything, didn't hang up. Finally, he goes, no, it wasn't all six of them. That means he killed some of them. That's a threshold admission. Now, at this point, I don't want to scare him. So I said, we'll talk about this again in the morning. I got off there and I told my partner, you ain't going to believe this. After Thomas Richard Bundy's death, we decided we're going to Burke Burnett, Texas. We're going to go talk to Mrs. Bundy. So Chris and I drove over there, and Chris was looking at me like, and he said, 
You know, this is going to be really awkward, isn't it? And I said, yep. This is what we get the little bucks for. <clears throat> we went in there, <clears throat> very pleasant. I said hello to Mrs. Bunday, and I just started to talk to her. I said I was sorry for the passing of your husband. Uh, it's, a, it's a real tragedy, but there's some questions I want to ask you. Basically what I got from her, she said that their marriage was not good. She said that she suspected he had fantasies or some things going on with other girls. She said, <clears throat> I went looking when he wasn't home and I found in his sock and underwear drawer, I found a uh, manila envelope taped up and I opened it. And inside were a bunch of photographs, girls and women in bikinis or various stages of undress. He was living his fantasies by watching these women and photographing them. I asked her, what did you do with these photographs? And she said, well, we had like a garbage pit in the backyard. I took it back there and just threw it in that garbage pit. I said, did he talk to you at all about this when we arrived with the search warrant and everything? And she said, uh, not really. But I read that whole paper that you left there, those papers. She read the entire affidavit, our case. It pretty well spells out that her husband is a serial murderer. And I said, so what happened that evening after we left? She said, nothing, he didn't say anything. And then that night we went to bed. No confrontation, no nothing. She just didn't want to believe it. <laughs>